Well, good morning. God is good. And all the time. It is so great to welcome you all here on this beautiful Sunday morning. We have been so blessed the last four weeks. A couple of, of the days were a little cold, but can't get better than this weather-wise. And I just want to welcome you here this morning. Uh, if you're in your car, if you want to listen to the radio, it's 100.1. Uh, or those of you, of course, here can hear through the speakers. And welcome to those of you who are online. And uh, just so good to be in God's presence this morning, knowing that God has good things in store for each and every one of us. Uh, as we get started today, just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, we're excited that we get to host a drive through chicken barbecue for the Finley Lake Fire Department on the 4th of July. And uh, people are needed to help um, serve and cook. Uh, we cook the chicken right up in the pavilion up here, and then we'll have a drive through system where people from town uh, come through for the chicken. If you would like to help out, please get in touch with Jeff Park. If you need Jeff's phone number, you can come see me. But we would love to have people help cook and uh, pass people their food through their car windows, and it'll be a great way to reach out to our community. As we enter into worship today, know that uh, God is good, Jesus is on the throne, our God is for you and not against you, and so let's enter into his presence uh, with confidence and joy this morning. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, you are so good, and what a beautiful day that you've given us to sit here, to stand here, to sing your praises, to hear from your word, and just to be reminded that you are a God who can be trusted. You are a God who deserves our full worship and devotion. And so, God, we offer you our lives here this morning. We offer you our families. We offer you our futures, the past, present, and the future. And we pray, Lord, that you would take us in our weakness, in our brokenness, in our joy, in our pain. Take us, forgive us, heal us, strengthen us, and mold us into the people that you want us to be so that we might live for your glory to honor you. God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be poured out upon us, that we would experience you in a real and powerful way, that you would give us an ability to see through your eyes, that you would give us a, a desire to worship and live for you with everything that we have. God, you are so good. We love you, and we thank you for your presence with us. In Jesus' name, let's enter into a time of worship. As we continue in prayer, there are a few people we want to lift up. Uh, we want to lift up uh, Mary Giles' uh, brother, Billy Joe, and also Tina, and they need prayers for healing today. Uh, also, we have been praying for Dennis Stork, uh, Courtney, and he, I believe as we speak, is going back to the hospital, and so we want to pray for him. He has uh, a mass that continues to, to be tested and is uh, dealing with pain and, and uh, the effects of that, so we want to pray for uh, Dennis's healing as well. And... Um, I, we continue to pray for Pam. It's so wonderful to have Pam here. Uh, my mother-in-law, Joan, had successful surgery on her, her parathyroid uh, this past week. And so um, we continue to pray for God's healing in, in the lives of all who need it this morning. Let's go to, before the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you once again for drawing us together as the body of Christ. And Lord, we thank you that by your grace, you invite each of us to connect to your family by grace through faith. And God, we thank you that each and every person here plays a precious role in the local church, your body. And Lord, those who are watching online, those who have gathered here, those who can't be with us today as well, play an important part in the body of Christ. We each are, are a member of the body with important tasks and gifts and abilities that you've given us. And God, as we continue in worship today, we pray that you would reveal to us how you are calling us to step into the plans that you have given us uniquely as your people. And God, I pray that uh, you would help us to develop the talents and the abilities so that we can make a life-changing, world-changing impact on the people around us. God, today we lift up for each and every part of the family that is struggling or hurting today. God, we think of those who are dealing with uh, bodies that need to be healed. Uh, we think of Pam Post. We think of Dennis Courtney, for Joan Parker, uh, for Billy Joe and Tina. For so many, Lord, among us, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that you would touch them and heal them. God, we pray for those who are dealing with broken relationships. I think of the marriages, the families that are struggling and hurting right now. So many are dealing with conflict and, um, and pain. And God, I pray that you would give them wisdom and peace. God, help us to trust in you as the God of reconciliation. God, I pray that you would guide us and direct us as your people. We want to be people who love you and honor you and serve you. And God, I just pray that you would give us eyes to see uh, the path that you have set before us. God, give us peace in knowing that you love us and you desire to lead us as a good shepherd. God, once again, we pray your blessings upon the graduates. Give them wisdom and strength. Give them faith uh, to love you more and to serve you with everything that they have. 
God, we pray that uh, you would help us to be change agents in our community and our world. We look around the world and we see such pain and division. God, give us wisdom. Help us to be your ambassadors. Help us to radiate your love. Help us to speak the truth of our con convictions. God, help us to be humility or humble in the salt of the earth. God, I pray for our leaders. We pray for leaders at every level of national, state, and local governments that you would give them wisdom and hearts of peace and unity. We pray for our president that you would give him wisdom and guidance. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, all of our officials that you would guide them. God, we want to be a nation that honors you. And so, Lord, work in the hearts of our leaders. Work in our hearts that we might reflect you to the world. Uh, God, we pray for all those who are suffering around the world. We think about how we worship here in freedom and so many around the world are not able to do what we're doing right at this very moment. So we pray for the persecuted church. We pray for those whose lives are threatened by simply speaking the name of Jesus. And God, we pray your protection and peace would be upon them. God, we pray for those who are suffering around the world and that you would raise up your people to be your hands and feet wherever there is suffering, that we might be uh, people of hope who share the name of Christ through our words and our actions. God, as we continue to worship, we uh, love you and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we go to God's word this morning, I invite you to turn, if you have your Bibles, your phones, turn to Matthew chapter 25. Uh, we'll be looking at verses 14 through 30, the parable of the talents. And uh, just to get us caught up, we are in week two in this series on parables. We're looking at the parables of Jesus. And a parable is an earthly story with a spiritual lesson. And Jesus spoke through parables to, uh, to teach about God and his kingdom. And today we're focusing on the parable of the talents. And this might be a confusing word or a confusing idea, but the reason we have the word talent in the English language is because of Jesus and this teaching from the New Testament. The word talent comes from the Greek word talenton, and that was a measuring unit of weight that was used to measure most often money, such as a talent or a gold or go talent of gold or silver. And so when we're talking about talent today, we're using it to uh, metaphorically to speak about gifts and talents and abilities. But in the ancient world, talents were a sum of money, a weight of something that had precious worth. And, and just to let you know about the, the value of a talent was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, compared to our money today. So in this parable, Jesus uses the word talent, once again, to represent God-given stewardship that we are entrusted with, including our abilities. And this parable was so familiar in 14th century Britain that the word talent became part of the English language, again, to mean abilities and giftedness, even though in the ancient world it would, was a, a weight of money. So as we dive into this passage this morning, the question that should come to our minds as we look at this parable is, what am I doing and whom am I serving with a talent and ability that God has given me? What am I doing and whom am I serving with a talent that God has given me? So let's dive into Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. And it's a lengthy parable, so lean in. And I, I encourage you with all these parables, listen as if for the first time, as if you've never heard it before. Imagine Jesus speaking these words to his people, and uh, we are his hearers, and these words are just as relevant for us 2,000 years later as they were uh, in the first century. So Jesus teaches the parable of the talent, saying this, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another, two bags of gold, and to another, one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on in his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. 
His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, once again, we just ask for your Holy Spirit to come, open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears, that we might hear clearly the word that you have for each and every one of us here today, for each and every person listening in. For God, you have great plans in store for us, and we want to be people who lean in and receive and welcome the plans that you have. So God, help us to be hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we look at this parable, it comes right smack dab in the middle of Matthew chapters 24 and 25, where Jesus is teaching all about the coming kingdom. And he is preparing his, his disciples. He is preparing all who were listening to him 2,000 years ago that he is coming back and that God's kingdom will come in final form and that we need to be ready. And so as we look through chapters 24 and 25, there's all kinds of teaching about the end times and how... Jesus will come like a thief in the night. No one will know the day or the hour. Uh, Jesus teaches all kinds of things about uh, the virgins who need to be ready. There are parables about being ready. There are parables about being uh, faithful. There are parables about being uh, alert. And here is a parable that is about being faithful, but it's also about being productive. And we are called to be faithful and productive because it is the outflow and the overflow of the salvation we have received by God through faith in Jesus Christ. We're not saved by our good works, but we are saved to do good works. I remember, Heather and I remember one day walking by the kitchen in one of our previous churches a long time ago, and there was a bunch of people just working so hard to put on a church dinner, and uh, we overheard one woman say to the other woman, there's got to be an easier way to get into heaven than this. And uh, the other woman said, well, there is. And, uh, you know, I think about those two, and it, and it was a funny conversation. I hope the first one was joking. We're not saved by our good works or serving at a church dinner, uh, God forbid. We are saved by grace through faith. Jesus, through his shed blood, his broken body, his risen life, his grace and mercy, he offers us forgiveness, salvation, new life. We can be born again to the kingdom of God. That comes from no effort on our own. We, we receive it as a free gift from God. But if we have received that gift, there should be works that demonstrate that we have received the grace of Jesus into our lives, that we are different because Christ is alive in us, that we are not living unto ourselves, but we are living unto the Christ who has taken up residence in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That by his blood we are forgiven, we are set free. By his risen life we are made new, and we are empowered to live the life that God has called us to live. And, and that's what Paul says. Paul says... That what we have in Christ, it's because he lives in us. For it's Christ in us who is the hope of glory. And so if we are sitting here, if we have breath in our lungs, if we know Christ as our Savior and Lord, we have hope because Christ has taken up residence and he lives his life through us. And that should be reflected in good works, in faithful living, in productive service to God and to our world. I share from time to time, we are not just saved from something, we are saved to something. I think some people in the Christian world, hopefully this is not said of us, they think, I am saved from sin and death, by, and, and praise God for that. 
But if we lose the, the, the sight, if we lose the reality that we are also saved for something or saved to something, we are saved to freedom and joyful lives of service within the kingdom of God. If we lose that aspect, we are missing out on the purpose for which we were created. We're not just saved from sin and death and hell. We're saved for heaven. We're saved for good works. We're saved for joyful, productive service within the kingdom of God, which we know, my goodness, God counts me worthy, worthy not because of my merit, but because of Christ in me. I'm counted worthy to serve and to live and to give as a part of the kingdom of God. And there is no higher calling. There is no greater purpose than this side of the equation. If we just walk around living out this part, yeah, we should be grateful that we're saved from sin, death, and hell. Absolutely. And if we don't know Christ this morning and we don't know that we're saved from sin, death, and hell, that's something that we better take before the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, help me to know what that means. Help me to trust you as a Savior and Lord of my life. But we don't just want to walk around and say, all right, I'm, I'm, one day I'll go to heaven, but I'll just walk around aimlessly till then. No, it's, wow, my highest calling is to know that I live each day in fellowship, in love with the Savior who died for me and rose again. And my highest purpose, whether I go into an office or whether I work out in a field or whether I go to school and do, do my studies or whether I go out and perform on the athletic field, my highest calling is to serve the one who gave, gave me life. And there is no higher calling than that. And so Jesus speaks this parable to teach us how to live until he returns because he wants, to be, he wants us to be faithful and productive. I said all that in a long way. Paul says it very nicely here in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God and not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we are saved by grace through faith, but let us live that out through the faithful use of our talents and our abilities. So let's wrestle with this passage. We might hear this and say, well, what talents? You know, what talents, God, have you given me? And that's what we want to focus on today is that every single person in this passage whether the person received five talents of gold or two talents or one talent, every person received something. They were not left empty-handed. They were given something to use for Christ, for God, for their master, and for his kingdom. And so again, what are you doing with the gifts that God has given you? I want to just say this as clearly as I can. You are loved and you are gifted. You are loved and you are gifted. And your highest purpose and your greatest joy will be living out and using the gifts that you have been given, not so that you can receive accolades and recognition for yourself, but so that you can know the smile and the joy of your heavenly father. I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit, but what does the master say when he comes to settle the accounts? Whether it was a person with five talents or it was a person with two talents, the master gave the exact same words of love and welcome and recognition. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with what you have been given. And so you have been faithful with a few things. Now you will be responsible and faithful with many things. And then he says, come and receive. Come and share in my happiness. You are loved and you are gifted. This is a special word for our graduates too. You are loved and you are gifted. And God has your entire future before you. He has a plan for you to, to walk with you as you use the gifts to glorify and honor him. If you are a note taker this morning, the first point is to be faithful with what you have been given. Whatever that is, what you, we are called to be faithful with what we have been given. And a second point is this. A sour attitude steals away the joy of serving God. I'll say that again. A sour attitude steals away the joy of serving God. It's obvious that one, the, the main climax of this parable is that with this 
third servant who was given one talent of gold who didn't want to do anything with his gold. He had this distorted view of God or his master, and he just buried his talent in the ground and did nothing with it. And so when the master returned after a long journey, he came to settle the accounts. And the third servant said, well, here's my one bag of gold. I know that you're, you know, not a good guy. And so I just, you know, hid it in the ground and buried it. But here it is. Rather than use the one talent he had been given, he buries it in the ground. And the landowner or the master describes this servant as lazy and wicked. This servant had a sour attitude toward the master. And, and this, this servant assaults the character of the master. And this reminds us that if we are not joyfully using the gifts and the talents that we have been given, we should go before the Lord in, in prayer and say, what is my posture towards you, God? Is there some unresolved bitterness? Is, it, is there some sort of distorted thinking or warped attitude that is that is robbing my connection with you so that I'm unable to serve you in a way that brings joy to both of us. What is your posture toward God this morning? Are you mindful of his love? Are you grateful of his grace? Are you praising him for the blessing of each day? This servant had a sour attitude. He buried his talent, and then he starts giving all these excuses. Well, I was afraid. I don't know what he was afraid of, I wonder if he was afraid of comparison. And does that speak to any of us here today? You know, I, I, I've, I've shared from time to time that in myself, it's so crazy how within the human heart, we can so easily drift toward the sinful extremes of pride and insecurity. Anyone else? Maybe you're too insecure to raise your hand. I'm kidding. But so often we can drift toward pride and insecurity. And sometimes it's because of pride that we, ask, we act insecurely, and sometimes because of insecurity we act with pride. And I wonder if this is what this, this third servant was dealing with, was the comparison, because he only had one talent, and these other two servants had five, ba five talents and two talents, respectively. Let me say this, whether it comes to our money or our talents or our success, comparison is the thief of joy. Jesus wants us to know his love, to know his grace, and to stay in our lane and not compare ourselves, well, that person has so more, and oh, pity that person who has so much less, but just to stay in our lane and use the gifts that God has given us to make an impact. But this, this third servant, he was prideful, or maybe he was insecure, he was fearful, and the, the comparison game he played in his mind was if only. Have you ever played that game in your mind? If only I had been given the talents of these other two men, then I would have done something. I would have stepped up to serve God, but you didn't give me as much as, the, as these others. So, you know, if only you had, I would have gotten more involved. If only uh, I had a better personality or more ability, I would have led that small group. If only my voice was a little better, I would have used my talent to sing in church. If only I had a little more, I would have given more time, more talent, more treasure for your kingdom. If only, if only, if only we'll steal the joy that God has for us in serving him. When we are tempted to complain, if only, God says to us, don't worry about the person on your left or to your right. You are loved and you are gifted. Stay in the lane that I have marked out for you and use the gifts to glorify me and to serve the world with love, those around you. What would happen? You know, I have to ask myself this question too. What would happen if we stopped focusing on what we lack and we started focusing on what we have? What we have at our fingertips, what we have within us. What, how much more service could we give to our Lord? How much more of an eternity-changing impact could we make on our world if we stopped focusing on what we lack and we started focusing on what we have? We could make a huge impact on this world. And I love the ways that I see in, in us as the body of Christ when we give a portion of what God has entrusted to us. There's nothing that brings my heart more joy than hearing how somebody within our church family has blessed somebody else by reaching out in love through a visit or a phone call or sharing uh, the love of Christ in some way. I love getting on Facebook and, and seeing the Facebook page of my friend Chad Bader who's serving in Guatemala as they, as they drive pickup trucks around the nation of Guatemala and serve food to hungry people. I love knowing, God, you have made us a part of your work. 
And there's so, so much joy in knowing that these people who are hopeless without food are now experiencing the love of Jesus through bagfuls of rice and beans and other food. They're, re they're receiving that they're as the hope of Jesus in their lives because of the faithfulness of God's people as he has given through us. It is such a joy to see God give in us and through us, to multiply what we give, to, to bless the people around us. But if we bury our talent, if we play the game, if only, if we compare ourselves and, with others and so we never focus on what God has given us to use for his kingdom, if we bury that, we won't get to see the fruit and the joy of how God wants to work in us and through us. This third servant, he, is, he had a distorted view of the wealthy landowner. He probably thought, my one talent won't make any difference anyway. My master, this landowner, he, he harvests where he doesn't even sow. What kind of guy is this? He had a distorted view. And that causes us to re reflect on our own lives. Is there some way that I'm not seeing Christ accurately and truthfully in my life? Do I have some sort of bitterness or distorted, warped attitude that's keeping me from joyfully receiving the love and grace of Christ in such a way that I receive it and then it overflows in me and through me to my family, to my spouse, to my children, to my community, to the world around me? If we bury our talent in the ground, we won't be able to see the fruit and experience the joy of being a part of what God wants to do in us and through us. As I was thinking about this message, I thought about my iPhone. Uh, I, I'll, I'll try not to shed too many tears, but right now I have a cracked iPhone screen. Don't you hate it when that happens? I, I told Heather I might just have to get a new iPhone as a tool for ministry, and, you know, that's probably what God is leading me to do. Sure, I could get the glass fixed. I, I won't get into that, and I won't bring my marriage into this sermon. Um, but as I think about my cracked iPhone screen, it kind of reminds me of this third servant who buried his talent, who had a distorted view of the world. Because I look into my iPhone right now, and actually it works fine. I shouldn't say that or else Heather won't, get me, won't let me get a new one. But it actually works fine with this screen. And, and actually there is a world of possibility with what I could do with my iPhone. But when I look at it and I just see all the, the shards of glass spider webbing throughout the screen, it would be very easy for me to say, what good is this? What can I even do with this? But actually, it's fully functional. And that's sometimes how people are, where they see through the broken, cracked lens of their lives, and they shortchange what they think they're able to do for Christ and his kingdom because they're looking from a place of brokenness. They're looking through eyes that are distorted, and they think, woe is me. I don't have as much as other people. I'm not as gifted as other people. I'm fearful of what others might think. God really hasn't done much for me anyway. Why should I serve? I don't have anything to serve. I don't have anything to do. And this is a reminder for us. If we're in a place where we're seeing through a distorted lens, if we're coming from a place of brokenness in our own hearts, God is not here this morning trying to just squeeze you to get as much productivity out of you as he can. But he comes to us in love. And he says, I want to heal and repair and restore your heart that is broken and vulnerable. And I want to do a work in your eyes so that you start seeing your future, you start seeing your talents, you start seeing your life through my eyes. So you're not hindered in loving me and serving me because of the view that you currently have. And God wants to restore us, renew us, give us new vision so that we can once again serve from a place of joy and peace and see clearly the opportunities that he has set before us to make a difference in this world. And so if you've been serving, or maybe if you've been prevented from serving because you've had a, a sour attitude or a broken heart, let me remind you to fix your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, and receive his grace that transforms and renews so that you can come before the Lord knowing I am a child of God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God loves me and lives his life through me, and the world is at my fingertips because Christ is leading me one step at a time. And know that God expects nothing more and nothing less than for you than to be faithful with what you've been given. We are all equal in value in God's eyes. But when it comes to our abilities, we are different. There are some who are five-talent people. I wish I was one of them, comparison. And anyway, 
There are some five talent people. There are some two talent people. There are some one talent people. And perhaps most of us are one or two talent people. What difference does it make? God loves us and he has a future for us. He has goals for us. He has dreams for us. And he wants us to be faithful in using them. But there are some who have great intellectual capability and others not so much. There are some with great physical ability and some who do not have that. There are some with great musical ability and others who do not. The important thing to remember in this parable is not one of them was left empty-handed, but they were all given actually a vast sum of money equal to lots of talent and ability where the master says, take this, this great sum, this great value, this great uh, stewardship of ability and use it for my glory. You and I, again, may not be five talent people, but we have gifts, we have talents, and we have abilities. And again, the question is, will we faithfully put to use what God has given us until Jesus returns or calls us home? Anytime we use our talents to help others, that is ministry. Ministry is not just what Pastor Dave does on Sunday morning. Ministry is what the body of Christ does throughout the week. And ministry is just sharing our gifts, sharing our abilities to, to love and bless those around us. Whether it's uh, sharing a meal with somebody who is going through a hard time or baking a pie for somebody who's going through a tough time or writing a card or leading a small group or teaching a Sunday school class, that is all ministry. And everyone, if we are in Christ, everyone is a minister. We are serving. That's one of the things we believe as, as Christians is the priesthood of all believers. We are all priests. We are all ministers. We all have talents to use to bless God and bless the world. You know, and we might think we're a one-talent person. My mom jokes that her only spiritual gift is to hug people. And I say, Mom, think about the power of a well-timed hug in the life of a person who's struggling. Maybe not so much in the pandemic. But that's a, that's a powerful, powerful life-changing moment. If somebody hugs you with the love of Christ when you are going through a tough time, that is exactly what Jesus wants to do in the life of that person who's hurting. And that does make a, a huge impact on the world. Every one of us, even if we think our only spiritual gift is to hug people, we are gifted and can change the world as we offer our gifts and our abilities to the Lord who created us and loves us. So let's not let a sour attitude or the comparison trap or lame excuses keep us from using our talents, but let's go and live the lives that Jesus is calling us to live as we offer our talents, as we offer ourselves in service to the world. The great news for us is if we serve Christ faithfully, if we live out of the overflow of his grace within us, we all hear the same beautiful words when we meet Jesus face to face. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with small things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share in my happiness. Come and share in my joy. Don't you just want to live each day for that moment when your eyes meet the eyes of Jesus? and you experience those words of love and welcome, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's, that's a powerful, life-changing truth. And this is why we need these parables so much in our world today. In a world that is broken, in a world that is fractured, in a world that it needs healing, we need this powerful, life-changing truth of Jesus to speak deeply within our hearts that we, that every person in this world might know they are loved by God, they are precious to God, and through his grace, they can be saved and live a life that pleases him. As we close, I want to share these words from an old, old song, uh, and it's by Amy Grant, and it's the words, uh, it's the song, uh, All I Ever Have to Be. And I just want to read the first verse and then the chorus, and this will be our closing but Amy Grant, the singer-songwriter, she, she sang these words, and I'd encourage you, you can probably find it on YouTube and listen to it later, All I Ever Have to Be by Amy Grant. And the first verse goes like this, When the weight of all my dreams is resting heavy on my head, and the thoughtful words of help and hope have all been nicely said, but I'm still hurting, wondering if I'll ever be the one I think I am, I think I am. And then here's the chorus. All I ever have to be is what you made me. Any more or less would be a step out of your plan. As you daily recreate me, help me always keep in mind that I only have to do what I can find. And all I ever have to be, all I ever have to be, 
All I ever have to be is what you've made me. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before you thankful for your grace that is at work in our lives. God, we thank you that through the work of Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection, we can be forgiven of our sins. We can be born into the kingdom of God. We can live as your precious and beloved children. And Lord, help us to know what that means to live for your kingdom, to, to love you and to serve you with all that we have. God, I pray for anyone here who's had a hard time relating to you or serving you because maybe they have a broken heart or maybe their vision has become cloudy. God, would you wrap your arms of love and grace around them? Remind them that they, through faith in you, are a precious child of yours and that you have beautiful and dream dreams and plans for them. God, help each and every one of us to know that we are loved by you and that you have gifted us with an ability to change the world. And so, God, help us to receive your gifts and to put them to use today in a way that would bring you honor and in a way that would bring us joy. God, if there's anyone here who's never received you into their life as Savior and Lord, God, we pray that today would be that day. Today is the day of salvation. We thank you, Lord, for your promise that to all who receive you, who believe in your name, you give the power to become children of God. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We pray that anyone here who does not know you would, would receive you through faith and just invite you in to forgive their sin and to make them a child of yours. God, as the body of Christ, would you unite our hearts together in unity? Would you unite us in purpose so that we can be uh, a, an army that lives for you, an army that shares your love, an army that, that lives and proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is hope, there is salvation, there is forgiveness, there is heaven in your name. God, strengthen us to serve you, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That Wesley prayer is a powerful, life-changing prayer of relinquishment. You know, let me be full, let me be empty, uh, but just use me, God. And uh, as we go uh, out to serve the, the Lord, um, one of the things that just came to my mind is about 10 years ago, there was a 75-minute special on ESPN called The Decision uh, with LeBron James. And if you remember that, that's probably one of the most famous or infamous statements about talent uh, that's been spoken in the last decade. And it was this long, drawn-out show about where LeBron James would choose to play basketball as he had been playing for the Cleveland Cavaliers. And there are the Knicks and Miami Heat and a few other teams all on, uh, all on uh, uh, the list as possibilities. And what did LeBron James say? I'm going to take my talents to South Beach and play for the Miami Heat. And uh, it was this thing that crushed the hearts of the Cleveland Cavs fans, and it was um, something that seemed a little narcissistic at the time. But here's what I want to say. As, as big as that statement has become, it's almost become a punchline in our world today. I'm going to take my talents here. I'm going to take my talents there. The most life-changing thing that can happen is our, in our world, as one by one, as believers of Jesus Christ, we say, I am going to take the talents that the Lord has given me into the world where he has placed me to, to make a difference for his glory. And so that's way bigger than where an athlete's going to play. What's way bigger than that is when you and I say, I'm going to take my talents, I'm going to take my abilities through the local church, I'm going to take them into the world to, to love people, to heal people, to care for people, to serve people in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's go out with that attitude that we are going to offer whatever the Lord's given us. We're going to offer that to him and uh, to just see what he can do through us. Thanks so much for coming to worship this morning. Again, let's take our talents, let's take our abilities, let's take our hearts for Christ into the world this week and uh, just love people in the name of Jesus. Our world is hurting, our world is angry, our world is confused, and we have something the world desperately needs, the life-changing, eternity-changing hope of Jesus Christ. So as you go from this place, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. If any of you are struggling with uh, knowing how God is calling you or if you're coming from a place of hurt and woundedness, there are people in our church, myself included, who would love to meet with you and pray with you. Uh, send me a message and uh, we'd love to meet with you or let us know before you leave today. But uh, have a great week and God bless.